Welcome everyone to the business session. My name is Jim Gilmore. I'm the uh, commission chair. I'll be chairing the meeting today. Um, we got a few things on the agenda today, so we'll get right into it. Um, first order of business is uh, approval of the agenda. You should add in your briefing package. Is there any uh, changes to the agenda? Seeing none, we will adopt that by consent. It was also approval of the proceedings from the February 2019 meeting. Uh, I hope you had a chance to review those. Are there any changes to the proceedings? Seeing none, we will adopt those by consent. Uh, before each meeting, we open it up to the public. If there's any comments not on the agenda, is there any public comment? I've seen nothing beforehand, so I'm assuming nothing unless you raise your hand if you wanted to comment. Okay, seeing none, we will move right into our first business item. Uh, we're going to have a reviewing and consider approval of the 2019 through 2013, 2023 strategic plan. This is a final action, so we will need a motion to vote on it, and uh, Bob's going to take us through that. Bob. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, as you'll remember, we had a, a lengthy discussion at the February meeting of the commission to, to review a draft of the strategic plan. Um, staff has gone back, taken those comments to heart, and uh, modified the document. Tina did a lot of the work. And I'll just quickly go through the changes rather than go through the whole document. There, um, in your briefing materials, there is an updated strategic plan with the uh, changes were tracked in red. So hopefully it's pretty, pretty straightforward to see the, the few places that we did change in response to your comments. Um, <clears throat> just briefly going through those on page two, um, you'll notice that we um, on page two, stretching over to page three, we added back the values that we had proposed taking out, but based on the discussion at the last meeting, there's, there's sentiment that, you know what, those, value, those values are something that the commissioners refer to and are, are worth keeping in the documents So we um, sort of reinstated the values. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The next, next change that we made was, I think, based on a comment that Justin Davis made, um, you know, he said, which is farther down under the first uh, driving force, which is changing ocean conditions. Um, there's a note there that the, you know, the stocks are moving and, and science was having a hard time keeping up. And in fact, really science is doing a pretty good job of keeping up. It's the stock assessment work and the workload associated with that. That's where things are lagging at times. Um, <clears throat> and then just changing some of the, the wording about uh, further down that paragraph, changing some of the wording relative to uh, changing co ocean conditions and how they've contributed to shifts in species distribution um, and noted that there's expanding range as well as uh, climate impacts on species that, that affect their distribution. And then we changed a will to May. Uh, moving along further in the document, once you get into uh, goal number one, <clears throat> We added the word sustainable. We had, if you recall, at the last meeting, there was some conversation about is it really the ASMSC's job to promote fisheries or promote the products that come out of our fisheries or whatever it may be. And what we really need to do is promote sustainable fishery management and sustainable coastal fisheries. So we added the word sustainable there. Um, <clears throat> down at the very bottom of, the, of goal number one in the intro paragraph on page six, uh, we added the statement, where possible, the commission will seek to aid in the rebuilding of depleted stocks whose recovery is hindered by factors other than fishing pressure. And this was the notion that there are things sort of outside of our control that, that prevent the rebuilding of a number of stocks, northern shrimp, southern New England lobsters, and some others. So we just sort of noted that here, that, that we'll, we'll do the best we can, but there's things that, that are beyond our control. We added a bullet under goal number one, to promote, which is linked back to <clears throat> the uh, word sustainable added to the goal itself which is promote sustainable harvest of and access to rebuilt fisheries. And this is in response to, also in response to a comment that I think Adam made at the last meeting about, you know, we, should, we need to work on making sure that when stocks are rebuilt, we, we, we um, allow access to those rebuilt stocks. Um, the next change, and if there's any questions or comments, feel free to raise your hands. Um, Next change is under goal number two. We added a, another bullet there, which is characterized the risk and uncertainty associated with the scientific advice provided to decision makers. And this is the idea that, you know, fishery science is, is, is not an exact science. The, you know, there, are, there, are, there is some uncertainty associated with any information that's provided to the board. The question is, you know, how uncertain is it? And 
kind of if, if you get it wrong, what is the risk associated with getting it wrong? And so we'll try to characterize that as we move forward with it with stock assessments. Um, <clears throat> and then there's um, those are the only changes in the body of the document that we made. Um, <clears throat> on the very last page, there's some notes that we, we talked about. Um, and we didn't, these were a little bit uncertain. There were comments made at the last meeting, but we weren't sure if we should weave these into the action plan or if these just kind of thoughts by, by one or so individuals that were things we should consider, but maybe not necessarily in this action plan, maybe part of a annual, I mean, maybe not part of the strategic plan, but maybe part of an annual action plan because they're actual uh, things that we need to work on. The first one was uh, an assessment of overall fisheries compliance. In other words, how are we doing? Um, you know, the commission obviously sets up regulations, the states implement those regulations, and we don't really go back and look um, overall, how are we doing? Are the, are the, uh, you know, are the stakeholders really complying with the, um, with the plans that we have in place? Are they, um, you know, or, or is there a lack of compliance which is impacting our ability to rebuild some of these stocks? And then the second um, idea that was talked about was this notion of, of removing barriers. Uh, I think Dan McKeon may have brought this up. Removing barriers to sort of the free flow of seafood commerce between states. Um, some states have historically had size limits and other things that have prevented um, seafood from being imported from a neighboring state or another state up or down the coast. And you know, is it is it the commission's job to promote that free flow of seafood between the states, or is that a commerce issue that the states you know should decide on their own? So, both of those, you know, I think the 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 review of compliance is probably something that we could put into an action plan. Although, you know, it's a very sort of I mean, it's a big project, but it's a bite-sized, one-time project. Um, the 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 barriers. I'm not. It was unclear whether that is a strategic plan thing for ASMFC or if that's just a, you know, something that we need to, to realize that the, there's a, there are some barriers that prevent free flow of seafood and states can kind of individually work on that. And that's how it's been um, tackled so far anyway. I know New York had made some changes. I think uh, Massachusetts had made some changes too to allow more products to be moved in and out of those states. So those are the, the quick summary, Mr. Chairman, of the changes that we made in response to the conversation at the February meeting. And I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thanks, Bob. Okay, question for up, David Pierce. Yeah, Bob, uh, one point, one change that was made uh, that's relative to uh, what was discussed earlier on, both the black sea bass and, and will be discussed about fluke, <clears throat> as with climate change. And the fact that uh, language has been moved a bit, uh, I think it now reads as proposed, where shifts are occurring, the commission may reconsider state-by-state -state allocation schemes. Before it said will. So uh, I, I don't understand why that change was made. When it can be demonstrated that shifts are occurring, then consistent with the whole policy we have relative to dealing with the allocation procedures, we should reconsider, we will reconsider. It may not happen. I mean, there may be eventual votes not to make any changes, but if it if, if it's has occurred, where shifts are occurring, then we will reconsider. So anyways, I just want to make the point that I don't support the, the change in the word from will to may, unless there's something I'm missing that uh, needs to be uh, explained for me so I can better understand the, the rationale. Um. At, at the last meeting, there was some conversation about, you know, does <clears throat> does the word will obligate the board to 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 adjust state by state allocations? And there was some nervousness that if we put the word will in here, then we then we are obligated, or you guys are obligated to go back, look at state by state shares, and make changes. Um, you know, the I think you're reading it as we're obligated to go back and look at it and, and consider the new information, we may not need to make changes. Um, so th there's sort of a, I think it was being read two different ways and, and you know, how, however the group decides is, is, is fine. <clears throat> Lynn, Fragley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just had a question about number one in the comments um, at the end about the uh, law enforcement um, committee review of state compliance. And I wasn't there uh, for the original conversation on this, so I definitely don't want to rehash it. But I was just curious how that relates to the um, review of compliance reports that we do for each species. And that technically, as I understand, there should be some um, 
you know, opportunity there to say whether or not states are in compliance or out of compliance. So I just wondered what, what, how, how this is different, I guess. Lynn, I think the difference is the annual compliance reviews are focused on do the states or do the states not have the correct regulations in place that are consistent with the FMP. This was a conversation about are the fishermen individually complying with the state's regulations? In other words, you know, they've got a, you know, sites limit on striped bass, are the fishermen ignoring that, or, you know, or is there some provisions in lobster management the fishermen are ignoring, or whatever it may be, you know, is there, is there sort of a, you know, a, is it a perceived problem, is it a real problem, is it, is it a systemic problem where fishermen are, just don't buy into some suite of regulations and aren't listening to them, I think is more what this is trying to get at, more, which is different than, you know, does Maryland have the right size limit in place for red drum or whatever it might be. Other questions for Bob? Okay, seeing none, as again, this is a final action, so we're going to need a motion. Okay, we've got a motion to approve the strategic plan by, as edited here, as edited here by Pat Kelleher. Do we have a second? Second by Lynn Fegley. Is there any discussion on the motion? Adam Nowalski. So just for clarity's sake on the point Lynn brought up, those two additional items, one and two, what is staff going to do with them? Where do they go if we don't provide some feedback today? Because I see them just as dangling chads right now. Uh, so so what, what would happen to them if we don't give some additional feedback here? My interpretation would be that for item number one, the compliance review, I think that could be considered to be added to the 2020 action plan when we get to planning for next year. Um, and then item number two, I, I think the commission would not include any language uh, relative to the free flow of seafood commerce and let that continue at the state by state level and, and ASMFC would not be involved in that. It's kind of, that's, a, that's my interpretation of where we are and if that's not right, I'm happy to go, go a different route. <clears throat> Everybody go with that. You go with that, Anna? Yeah, I've, honestly, I didn't have an opinion on it, so just wanted to make sure we knew where it was going. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that. Any other discussion on the motion? Okay, seeing none, is there any objection to the motion? This is a final action, so. All right, seeing none, we will adopt the strategic plan by unanimous consent. Thanks, everybody. And thanks for the great work from Bob and staff and everybody else actually all worked on it so great job um, next agenda item is another final action which we're going to be talking about the summer flounder commercial issues amendment that was a joint effort between the council and the commission um, the council and the board voted on this back in a few weeks ago on a joint meeting uh, so we have to take action on it now however since um, I have I know a little something about summer flounder in my state. I may have to get into the discussion, so I'm going to step away from the chair and let Bob take over. So, Bob, it's all yours. Thank you. Really appreciate the opportunity. <laughs> um, so uh, the the. Summer Flounder Scup Black Sea Bass Board met jointly with the Mid-Atlantic Council in March and they passed an amendment that is being brought forward today to, for consideration by the full commission. Under, under the commission's procedures, any new, new FMPs or full amendments that are approved by an individual species board have to be brought forward for consideration by the full commission. So this, this is a you know, standard step in the, the amendment approval process. So with that, Tony, do we have the, the motion from the? All right, we've got the wrong motion. We're going to have the right motion soon, which is, I think it's pretty straightforward. It just says to, uh, on behalf of the Summer Flounder Scout Black Sea Vest Management Board, recommend approval of the, I think we're calling it the Comprehensive Amendment, right, Tony? Comprehensive Summer Flounder Amendment. So um, we'll get that motion up, and then we'll, we'll initiate some conversations about that and, and decide if the commission's ready to go forward to uh, consider approval of that document. And while the motion is going up, I see Robert Boyle's hand. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just for um, those of us who are maybe a little out of the loop, can you, um, 
on the record tell us what the vote was, um, please. Yeah, the vote the vote at the management board was six to four, I believe, six in favor, four uh, in opposition. The Mid Atlantic Council voted on the identical motion. Their vote was fifteen to four, I believe. Um, so. So Tony's going gonna, Tony's gonna to be able to pull those up. That's my recollection of, of the votes from, you know, when this document, or when, the, when this was, motion was made and recommended to the full commission. All right, the motion is up on the board. I'll read that into the record. Move to recommend on behalf of the Summer Flounder Management Board to consider approval of the Summer Flounder, com, uh, Summer Flounder Commercial Issues Amendment. So um, that's the amendment, or that's the motion that's being brought from the uh, species management board to the full commission um, we can Kirby's prepared to give a quick summary of what's included in that document if you guys feel it would be helpful um, if you feel that you're knowledgeable enough around uh, the table and what's included then we can do that you know the biggest change in the document is summer flounder commercial state by state allocations um, the they're right now summer flounder is allocated to the states from Maine through uh, North Carolina on a state-by-state -state basis on the commercial side. There are Maine and New Hampshire get relative, very quite small shares, a few way out in the decimal points, uh, but the other states get get significant shares. Um, and what the change would be is that the, the the current shares would stay in place. However, any quota that is above 9.55 million pounds would be distributed through a new formula or be essentially all the states with, with small shares, which are Maine, uh, New Hampshire, and Delaware, would receive one-third of 1%, I believe, and the remaining states would all receive an equal share. So this wouldn't, so it's not, it's, you know, it, it's distributing the surplus or, or the quota above 9.55 million pounds differently than the quota that's below the 9.55 million pounds. So it's a, there's, a, there's that trigger. And so above 9.55, the three st small states that I mentioned would get their one-third of a percent, and the remaining states would get 12.375, I believe. Uh, so that, you know, there's, it, it changes the allocation moving forward. So that's the, that's the meat of the, the amendment that really is that question today. Uh, so with that, happy to you know, open it up for discussion and, and consideration uh, of the motion that's on the board. Any comments? Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a clarification, the way the motion reads, it says consider approval, but is that a motion for the commission at large to approve the commercial summer flounder amendment? Yes, it, it is for approval. Yeah. Mr. Reed. Thank you very much. So th the question that I asked at the original meeting was what happens if this body votes no? And I'd like to hear that from, I'd like to hear the answer from that from somebody so we all know what we're talking about. I can give you my perspective, but I believe Mike Pentney, the regional administrator from the Greater Atlantic offices in the audience, if he's willing to come forward and answer that question, that'd be, I think that'd be helpful. Thank you, Mike, and welcome. Hi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, to the commission. Uh, it's a good question, an important question, and we've, something that we've been uh, talking internally within the agency uh, and with council uh, leadership and commission leadership um, over the last month or so. The action of the council at their April meeting was the final action of the council. The motion was to approve the amendment and submit it to, uh, to me for secretarial review. They have not submitted it yet, um, but that's mainly because of, of work that staff is doing to complete some of the analyses and tidy up the document uh, and get it ready to submit for us to initiate a review. Once the council does submit it and we essentially put it on the docket, uh, that starts the review process under the Magnus and Stevens Act, which if you recall uh, has a 95-day clock uh, for review. Uh, to either approve or disapprove the amendment. Once the council submits it, we will initiate that process. Uh, certainly we will be evaluating the amendment uh, on the merits of uh, what's in the document, 
uh, for compliance with the Magnuson Act and other applicable law. But I think to get at uh, at least uh, part of what's uh, in this in this question is if a, if the commission were to not approve the amendment, uh, would that in any way um, affect our decision and process in terms of our review and approval of the amendment? And to the extent that we've I've had this discussion with uh, our general counsel and others, um, we see nothing inherent in a commission decision to disapprove the amendment that would preclude us from proceeding with uh, review and potentially approval and implementation of the amendment. So there is no, so a disapproval by the commission would not kill the amendment effectively. We could proceed um, assuming that the council were to submit it. Now I'll say sort of editorializing a bit that, you know, it was, the, the votes were, were Relayed, it was a 6 4 vote of the management board. Um, those of you involved in joint management with a council um, are aware that, at least with the Mid Atlantic Council, we have a process where every motion that comes up before the joint body, the council and the board, must be worded identically and pass both groups in order for that motion to proceed. So and at the meeting uh, in April, um, you know, every preferred alternative in that amendment was supported by both the council uh, and the board by majority vote. Um, and as you saw, there is a motion from the Summer Flounder Management Board uh, recommending the amendment be approved. And I say that as context for the fact that the council made a decision to approve and submit the amendment, I think, with the expectation that it would be approved and implemented by the commission as well. So were it to not be approved today, uh, I think it would certainly be something that the council should be made aware of uh, to give them an opportunity to think about if they want to change course at all. But you also heard the vote was a very strong vote in favor of this amendment. So I, I don't think that there would be much change expected, but certainly we would provide the council or we would consider providing the council the opportunity to, to think that since they haven't submitted yet. But once they do submit, uh, then we would start the process and, and, and go through secretarial review. Since I have the floor, if I could just explain another aspect of what happens uh, if the commission does not approve the amendment. Uh, it's a little bit more in the weeds, but you know, this amendment and our management structure being joint collaborative management between the two groups is very important in a, for a system of state-by-state state quota allocations because each state has an allocation of quota that is the same on the commission side and on the federal side under the council plan. We count all landings in a state, whether they be from federal permit holders or state-only permit holders, against that quota, that state allocation. So one potential implication of a disapproval by the commission is that we would be managing these state by state fisheries or these state fisheries under two different quotas. There would be a federal quota under the council plan, if assuming that it's a approved and implemented. And then there would be a quota under the commission plan that would be different. To throw out some numbers as an example, um, Massachusetts quota using the current quota allocation for, for 2019 and, and 2020 um, would be roughly a little over 100,000 pounds higher under the council plan than under the commission plan. But Rhode Island's would be around 66,000 pounds less under the council plan than under the commission plan. Now that creates a problem because for Massachusetts, which looks like they have a higher quota under the council plan, we would not take any action to shut down that fishery. But under the, under the commission plan, they would be required to, shut, to close their own fishery under the lower quota, not be able to take advantage of the higher quota uh, provided under the council plan. Rhode Island, on the other hand, having a lower federal quota, we would close federal waters to all federally permitted vessels and dealers when they hit the lower federal quota. If fishing were to continue in state waters, 
by state-only permitted vessels to take advantage of that extra 66,000 pounds, that would accrue as an overage against the following year's commercial federal quota, further exacerbating that disparity so that the following year's quota would be more like a 120,000 pound difference between the federal side and the state side. And you can see where this is going. As time progresses, there is the risk that those quotas would diverge more and more as landings accrue against the state quota count as an overage against the federal quota. So I hope, Mr. Chairman, I've answered the question adequately, but I'm certainly available to go into more detail or, or clarify any of those points. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate the, <clears throat> the detailed answer. I think that's helpful for folks around the table. Other questions or comments? Uh, yes, Tom Fody. I was going to bring this up tomorrow, and I probably will bring it up on the policy board. Is the joint meetings are not working for, for the commissioners. If we look at the attendance at the joint meetings for commissioners, we get the state directors, we get the people that sit on the council and the members that sit on the council and sit on the commission as either a government appointee or a legislative appointee. But we do not get the commissioners for a, a majority of the legislative and the governor's appointees at those meetings because they are not easily accessible. I mean, this next meeting is in Durham, North Carolina, as far as the way the, as far away as we can get from the fishermen. In Virginia Beach, it's not easy to fly in. And we were basically going to actually do a meeting, it was easy, which is Philadelphia. And now we've changed that to the October meeting in, in Durham, North Carolina. So it's not working for us, but it gets very expensive for us because we're putting a lot more people out to go there. Because by, you know, we're doing 10 states, it should be 30 commissioners there. And it's not. It was probably, uh, I would say, there were probably about 15 or 16 of, uh, so we're missing half the commissioners at the meetings. We need to find a new way of doing this. Now, I don't know if, that, if those commissioners were there, the vote would be different from six to four. I'm not sure. Probably not, but I'm not positive that it wouldn't have been. And so we really need to try and accommodate all the commissioners. And the only thing I can see is that we really need to have joint meetings or commission meetings after this year. Because the only way it's going to survive is, is we're going, because there's a lot of problems having it. And again, we find ourselves in places that it's not easy to get to. And unlike the council members, the commissioners, like the governor's appointee and legislative appointees, don't get paid GS-15 rates. So when they, when they have to take an extra day at each end of the, this three or four days of their time where they're taken away from their jobs, and, and they, unlike me, that doesn't get paid for anything. But what I'm saying for other people, I, and I've been looking at this very carefully, so we need to deal with how we deal with this. Thanks, Tom. Yes, David Borden, and then Jim Gilmore. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a question on, on process and timeline. As soon, if we pass a motion today, when would we likely implement uh, what's called for in the amendment? It, not, not when we implement it. When would we implement the revised, would likely implement the revised higher quotas. Is that going to be in 2020, 2021? Well, there's another part that was added to the motion that should have been up here the first time, which is the second sentence. The effective date of any FMP modifications would be consistent with the effective date published in the, in the final rule in the Federal Register. So basically, we've linked ASMFC's effective date to the final action by the Federal Government. So. Mike, if you're willing, can you comment on when the final action by the federal government might be? Thank you. Uh, it's often difficult to predict because there's a lot that can vary in terms of uh, when the council submits the document, although I expect that to be uh, sometime uh, early summer. Um, but, uh, you know, it is a complicated process to go through a review and implementation of an amendment, and what we don't like to do is implement in something in the middle of the year or very close to the beginning of a new fishing year uh, and change the, the baseline. So in discussing with staff, um, we expect that we would not be implementing in terms of an effective date for the new quota allocations, uh, most likely, almost certainly, uh, January 2021, rather than try to rush in uh, a new set of quota allocations that would be effective um, this coming January, particularly because we've already established uh, specifications for 20, 
2019 or you know through 2020 so thank you the follow-up David that was that was very helpful thank you Mike so the existing rules basically stay in, in effect until January 1st 2021 okay yep uh, Jim Gilmore Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and if everyone would indulge me, since uh, I maybe get a little bit more background to this and a history. Uh, and so New York is one of the four votes that voted against this, um, but I think it was some of the history may be helpful that some folks may be aware of. So four years ago, I was, this amendment was really initiated under, you know, from New York's pushing for some old issues. And primarily, if you looked at the percentages on the board before, that 1993, when we put in this state-by-state -state allocation system for commercial quotas, there was um, New York got significantly less than what we believed our fishery was, and there was data errors, and we won't get into the whole issue of that, but we though that 7% was based upon some errant data, which is now um, decades old. So our immediate issue was to try to maybe rectify that, but also look at some other issues. And, and our, our goal was uh, really to get some equity, at least between our neighboring states in New Jersey and Rhode Island, because if you look back in time, our fisheries were, I, I'd say, conservatively equal to those states, although I believe it was larger based upon the size of our fleets. Um, the other part of this was to start look, uh, and, and by the way, when I, I, my predecessor was here, I understand that we kind of reluctantly agreed to what happened with the, with the caveat that, well, we can always change this. So that was 1993. So we finally got to the point four years ago to start looking at maybe changing this. Um, the other issue was that we're well aware that there is many species that are, are moving up and down the coast, and particularly to the north, and summer flounder is probably the poster child on that. John Hare is in the room. I think he did a paper. I think we were at about 30 species that were changing their distribution. Um, and that's our primary job here. I mean, if, if we just had to set things in stone at one point and leave them, we wouldn't have to be here. We'd just leave it alone. But we are here to manage the resource and changes over a year or a decade or whatever. So that was the other part of this, was to start looking down a road on redistribution of stocks, because we have several that are, have been allocated decades ago, and we need to start addressing that change, uh, primarily, we believe, from climate change. Um, so the system we've had has been very frustrating for New York fishermen, So, and I, I hear it many times, is that the summer flounder stock, and again, don't believe me, look at all the data, is sitting off the south shore of Long Island, very close to shore. So if a New York fisherman wants to go fishing out there, he goes out a couple of miles from Montauk, catches, oh, he's got a limit of 70 pounds, next to boats from the south that have 1,000-pound trip limits. And then, essentially, right next to each other, they're fishing on the same body of fish, but not exactly equitable. The fortunate ones that um, actually buy permits from other states, they then have to they get that trip limit, say, of 2,000 pounds, but then they have to steam all the way down to the Carolinas or Virginia, offloading trucks, bring the fish back up, and then come back up. So not the most efficient way to prosecute a fishery. So we were hoping that this amendment would really get to addressing some part of that. Um, and, the other, and the other piece of it that wasn't mentioned up in the, uh, in the details of this was landing flexibility. Even if we couldn't get a reallocation, maybe some flexibility and you know, allowing some landings closer to home would help out. But that didn't go anywhere either, other than as a voluntary landings flexibility. But of course, if you don't have a, a partner that you want to work with, they're not going to agree to that. So. We, we essentially have gotten to this point where what our perception is from New York is that we went through four years and we came to a very slight tweak in what the status quo has been for um, a fishery that's using data that's 40 years old. Um, and we're in a bit of a dilemma because from my perception, uh, I'm not sure if we can get out of the box because we all have the same, we have a conflict. We have. We're supposed to be using the best science, the best data for management, but we're also supposed to protect our state's rights. And there's a, maybe a, 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 a catch-22, or for lack of a better term, that we can't get out of this. But um, 
unfortunately, we find ourselves sitting in front of a, a four-year effort that essentially changed nothing from our perspective. And the bigger concern is that we've got, again, many species that are doing this, and we're going to have to be having this meeting over and over again. So we were hoping at the joint meeting that we had back in March that we could throw a couple of more options up. That was actually the first part of this. Before this was voted, approved, or whatever, there was a motion. We had two or three other options. Let's take a look at those. Those were voted down. In fact, I believe there was a split on that because the council said, no, we don't want to look at additional options. The commission said, yes, let's look at some more options. Maybe we can come up with a, a solution that doesn't get us into this. Um, that motion was voted. Again, both bodies did not approve it, so it failed even though we had a difference between the council and the commission. And then when it came to the final vote, it was approved by a narrow margin. So um, I, again, thank you for letting me give you that history. But um, from New York's perspective and from a, the broader picture of this, we need to fix this. And essentially, uh, voting for this amendment right now is not fixing anything. And we're going to oppose the motion. Thank you. Eric Reed, you had your hand up? Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as far as Jim's last point at the last council meeting, what happened was because of the process of the council and the board, they take turns on each vote going who goes first and who goes last. Um, what happened was the, on, on the, the motion to allow additional introductions or reintroductions in some cases of, of management options, the council voted first and that vote was no. So the voice of the commission was not heard at that meeting. And of course, the commission represents some of, some of us in southern New England and the council, um, except for the, <laughs> the New England liaison who has no vote, is not represented. Thank you, Eric. Other comments, thoughts on the motion that's up on the board? We've got Emerson and then Justin. Thank you. So I'm going to expand a little bit on, on what Jim had mentioned in terms of some of the um, history behind this. So th the basis of the inequity in the state-by-state -state commercial, alloca commercial allocation is the system of accounting for commercial landings that was in place during the baseline period. So New York landings were determined on a completely different and separate methodology compared to all the other states during that baseline period. During that period, all states except for three um, had a what was called a way out system in place at that time, now called a dealer report. And that was put in place by National Marine Fisheries Service in all states except for three. Those three states were North Carolina, New York, and Connecticut. And in North Carolina, they already had their own well established. Um, dealer report way out system, so NIMS didn't have to implement one there. It already existed by the state. Um, so that left New York and Connecticut without a system similar to the data collection in all the other states. Connecticut was able to appeal um, the state by state allocation back in 1993 and got a little bit of relief in terms of increased allocation. Not what they were due, but they got a little bit of relief. <laughs> So that just left New York still um, on the short end of things. So it, New York has been at a severe and significant disadvantage for all of this time. And again, as, as Jim said, um, his predecessor agreed to this on the condition that this was going to be changed and revisited soon. Well, here we are 20 some odd years later in, in a four year process and th things have not, things really haven't changed at all. Unless you know there's a when there's an increase in the quota, um, the northern states get a little bit more. When they're when the quota goes back down again, then um, a lot of the effort to rebuild the resource or to rebuild the quota is based on the northern states because they have a, that low share based on on the history. Um, Jim also mentioned, you know, that there's been a documented shift in the distribution of the summer flounder resource. You know, that's, that's reality. That's a fact that's taken place. And everybody um, was sent a copy of State Senator Schumer's letter 
um, that, he, that he wrote. Everybody received a copy of it. So, you know, there's a political process that's taking place as well. Senator Schumer was ready last year and is probably ready this year to do what he can in the, in the state Senate um, and then perhaps uh, convince people in the House to, to go forward with a, with a system that changes the state-by-state -state allocation. We all know that the New York Attorney General has initiated um, legal action against the Department of Commerce. So that's where this is all headed, unless we can get together and figure this out ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Emerson. Justin Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to offer a substitute motion. Go ahead. I move to remand the Summer Flounder Commercial Issues Amendment to the Summer Flounder SCUP and Black Sea Bass Management Board to develop and consider new approaches, including alternatives that use a dynamic approach to reallocation of the resource that considers the species distribution. And if I can get a second, I'd like to speak to the motion. Thank you. And this is a substitute motion? Correct. All right. Emerson Hasbrook has seconded the motion. Go ahead, Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So <clears throat> I, I want to start off by acknowledging, you know, all the hard work that went into this amendment by Commission and Council staff, folks sitting around this table, many others. Uh, it was a big lift, and I don't want to discount the hard work that went into it. Uh, I also don't want to discount that at the recent joint meeting of, of this group in the Mid-Atlantic Council that some folks sitting around this table took a hard vote to allocate some more quota to northern states to to not realize some gains that could be made in the future in their state's quota. And so I also don't want to discount that. I think that suggests that folks around this table recognize that this is a problem we have to deal with and they were willing to take some positive action towards it. Uh, however, I, I can't support this amendment in its current form. And the reason why it really relates back to some of the same, same things Jim was talking about, I think we have a fundamental problem facing this commission and our federal partners of shifting species distributions along the coast and an accompanying need to reallocate access to those resources. I think this amendment was an opportunity to try to find a way forward on that. And I think for the future of, of the Commission's operations around this problem, we really need to find a new approach. And I think that approach needs to make good use of the available scientific information about species distribution. Uh, I think it needs to be a dynamic approach that sets some timelines on which we will consider quota reallocations. My concern with the current amendment is that after a four-year process, we've reached a decision that I don't think gets us to a new place in dealing with commercial allocation or quota reallocation, and there's no guarantee of when we'll revisit it. Uh, so I, I think that this amendment, although a lot of hard work went into it, doesn't get us to where we need to go in establishing a way forward for summer flounder and other species. So as I understand it, even though the council has closed the book on this, the commission hasn't. And I think there's still an opportunity for the Summer Flounder, Scup, and Black Sea Bass Management uh, Board to go, go back to the drawing board and continue to work on some of the approaches that were being developed that meet some of those standards that I'm talking about, that, that sort of lay out a timeline on which we'll consider quota reallocation periodically, that make good use of scientific information on species distribution. I thought. The point that Eric Reed made was really salient that the Commission's voice wasn't heard on some of the new proposals that were brought forward at that joint meeting. So what I'm asking for here is for this group to remand this back to the management board and, and have them continue working on developing some new approaches to deal with uh, allocation. Thank you, Justin. Dennis, you had your hand up. Is it on this motion or you, you're ready to go? Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think to quote a famous American in this room, we ain't got a dog at this fight. That would be Robert Boyle's 2018, 17, 16, 15, whenever. But New Hampshire will have a dog in the fight from the looks of things. As the resources are shifting, there may come a day when we could be in the same situation as, as previously described and looking at our action plan, our first goal is to rebuild, maintain, and fairly allocate Atlantic coastal fisheries. It goes on to talk about that 
FMPs will also address fair and equitable allocation of fishery resources among the states. That's in the first goal. And it goes on to say, understanding global climate change and its impact on fishery pro productivity, et cetera, and et cetera, I won't go any further. I think it's incumbent upon us not only to look at what's going on with black sea bass, scup, and summer flounder, that we look at this in a broader term, and we really have to do something immediately to address these issues, because they've gone, gone on long enough, and they'll continue to go on, but it needs, it needs to be attacked, and there has to be some sort of a, possibly a working group with, amongst the federal side and the commission side to come up with, as I've heard mention, a working group or something that will attack this problem and if not solve it, eventually f more fairly allocate the resources. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Others will go down this side of the table, Lynn and then Steve. Rob. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I just wanted to confirm that uh, Mr. Pentney very nicely outlined uh, the ramifications if the, if the amendment was voted down, and I just wanted to clarify that we would have still the same issues if it was remanded. Thank you. Mr. Pentney, are you comfortable with that? Thank you. I, I would say that, yes, all of those issues remain. Uh, and if I could, while I have the mic, just clarify that the intent here is for uh, the board to operate independent of the council uh, in development of new approaches. And uh, if maybe the maker of the motion or somebody could clarify um, how we would continue or, or proceed uh, under the rubric of joint management between the council and the commission um, if this motion were to pass. Lynn, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Justin, do you want to comment on, on Mike's question? Sure, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, that is my intent, is to ask the Summer Flounder Scup and Black Sea Bass Management Board to take another look at this issue and develop some other approaches that could be used specifically towards quota reallocation and then presumably to communicate those new options to this group and to the council as well. Where it would go from there, I'm not entirely clear. Great, thank you. And uh, Steve Murphy. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I certainly think this is going to continue to be an issue um, as you know, as we see uh, redistribution of. Uh, the geographic range of, of a lot of these uh, species and um, uh, you know looking at uh, some of the climate risk stocks uh, North Carolina seems to be on the departing end of, uh, of many of these and so uh, but in I, I just want to speak to to my state uh, because th this really isn't about uh, the management of the fishery itself it, it is about allocation but this species is an economic driver uh, in North Carolina. is the number five value commercial fishery in a very robust commercial fishing state. Um, if, if it was not efficient for boats to steam 24 hours, trawl 12, and come back, uh, they wouldn't be doing it. Uh, th we have worked uh, with partners in Virginia, uh, uh, especially to really maximize the value of this fishery. This is a high value fish. Uh, and so <laughs> there is infrastructure in place. There are processing houses, fish houses, repair yards. Um, you know, people all rely on this fishery. And so one of the goals of the, of the plan itself or of the amendment are, are to uh, optimize these economic and social benefits um, uh, from the utilization of this resource, and, and, and I would argue we are doing that. Uh, I thought that the uh, compromise that was made at the Mid-Atlantic Council uh, to fairly allocate the excess quota above 9.55 million was, it was fair. And, and when you look at the, uh, the fleets 
in the south that depend on this fishery, it is a significant source of income and uh, any, you know, significant reallocation of that would have serious negative consequences. So I, I just, I, I understand uh, where, where my colleagues to the north are coming from and I, I certainly, um, you know, scratch my head about how we, how we deal with these reallocation uh, issues, particularly in light of climate change, but, uh, but there's also a downside uh, for the southern states as well. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Rob O'Reilly and then David, you have your hand up? David and then Joe Semino and then Eric. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I think a lot of these issues have been well vetted um, through many committee meetings and many joint meetings. Um, I have seen this as an open process. I have seen that every state had opportunities. Um, at some point, about midpoint through this process, maybe year two and a half, because we're saying four years, but I find out from Kylie that it's really five, um, that there was dissatisfaction with the way the options were in the amendment. And there were other attempts at our joint meeting um, to introduce, New York introduced two other options, a negotiated quota and a fallback to the um, coastwide quota. I certainly don't find any fault with the position of New York um, that it finds itself in, but it's not because of the resource, um, it's because of other reasons. And the fishery itself has not changed that much. We heard a statement last time that the, uh, at a meeting, at the joint meeting, that the inshore fisheries in Virginia and North Carolina uh, essentially aren't where they were, but they never were. I mean, these fleets have been moving up the coast since the 80s. Um, so there's a fishery and there's the resource. Um, and I know everyone's focusing on the resource the last five years. Distribution, I'm a little perplexed that climate change can act so quickly because I don't think it does. I think most of the models that we hear from, including from Dr. Hare and others, aren't looking at the 10-year time frame, let alone the five-year time frame. So I, I don't think those are valid arguments. Um, I think we have to look at the fact that this fishery has been prosecuted uh, for many, many years in the northern sector, and that's really important. There was a public hearing. There were plenty of public comments. And, you know, just to talk about the landings flexibility, which, I mean, when I first heard landings flexibility, I thought, Oh, that sounds really interesting, even to the point where landings flexibility could end up with what Jim had talked about in a different way where you did allow trucking. Um, and, you know, that changed things a little bit. But the fact about landings flexibility is there's so many permits held by so many states in Virginia, for example, that even the joint combined North Carolina and Virginia permits are only about 45% of those permits. The rest are all out of state. And so I think that that's why landings flexibility probably didn't, you know, make it completely out as a great option. Um, it's just that this fishery is complicated in terms of the fishery and the permits. Um, I don't know how to help at this point other than to say the same thing I said at the joint meeting, which is everyone wanted to move off of status quo. We have moved off of status quo. I did talk to Mike Pentney um, and asked about the date when this would come into play and did learn then that it would be January 2021. I wish it were January 2020. I understand the hurdles that have to be overcome and the EIS to be finished and things such as that. So I do understand that. I also do understand, and, and I can be corrected if I'm wrong by Mr. Pentney, that the increased quotas at least will take place sooner than that. Um, so that's one thing that we can look forward to on the commercial end, um, that there will be increased quotas. Uh, what I had seen was about 10.899 million pounds. Um, that's just my uh, indication of once we subtract 
the discards that were attributed to 2017. So the last thing I want to say is exactly what I said at our joint meeting. This is at least a chance that we have to uh, go forward. It's not as far as some states want. I do understand that. But it doesn't end. I mean, everything everyone's talking about today, either not voting in favor of this or remanding it, where does that really put us compared to where we can still go forward from here by passing the amendment? So thank you very much. Thanks, Rob. I've got a pretty long list here. I've got David Borden, Joe Semino, Eric Reed, Jason McNamee, Pat Keller, Emerson Hasbrook, and then Tom Fody. So we'll go through that list, and then Robert Boyles and David Peer. We've got a long list. Um, so, uh, Point of order, Mr. Chairman? Yes, Adam. Might I suggest you consider taking for and against alternatively as we go through? Yeah, I'm fine with that. I, you know, it's just this discussion is pretty important. I want to make sure everyone gets gets to voice their opinion. You know, we're, we're bumping up against time limits already, but I think this is important, so we may have to slide back horseshoe crab a little bit. So those of you that are here for horseshoe crab, sit tight, get comfortable. We may be here for a minute. Um, but uh, let, me, let me go through a few of these folks, and then I'll start doing the alternate uh, for and against. Um, David Borden. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I was uh, one of the individuals at the joint meeting that voted against this. And uh, the basic rationale uh, for, for my vote was I didn't see uh, the solution that's been brought forth as solving the problems, fi fixing the problems. Uh, I, I supported um, the position that uh, we really should be dealing with these issues in a formulaic way uh, so we don't have to vote uh, on them. Uh, and it should, uh, recognizing the infrastructure considerations that a number of the Mid-Atlantic states have raised, uh, including today, the, any changes in the in the quotas from the, those that existed historically should be uh, done in a very gradual manner in order to to minimize uh, economic uh, uh, the negative economic implications of them. So I I, I look at this more uh, from the perspective of if we were to pass this as Justin uh, in, and others uh, have indicated. I, I would look at it as uh, going back uh, to the Mid-Atlantic Council, engaging the Mid-Atlantic Council with additional uh, discussions on how we could do uh, those types of changes, integrate those types of changes into the system, do this in a formulaic way, uh, and try to solve uh, of great importance to me is to try to solve the problems uh, in New York and, and Connecticut in particular. Uh, Rhode Island's very fortunate. We get a large portion of the quota. Uh, under the proposal, I would point out, we would get a large portion of the, the increase. Um, but proportionally, it's actually less than we get now. Um, and so uh, I think we have to look at this in terms of the process. This is one issue that the Commission is dealing with uh, that involves these types of issues. Black sea bass are right behind it. We're going to be dealing with Menhaden and striped bass. These are all horrendously divisive issues, and we've got to figure out ways to collaborate and cooperate better and compromise at this table. Uh, and so I would hope that, it, that people would vote for the alternative, and that would start that process. Thank you. Thank you, David. Joe? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, uh, I felt like we came through a very long process. As, as many of you know, this is my first year in New Jersey. My first week was this meeting last year, but it's, I've been with this issue since the beginning, um, spending 14 years in Virginia and a few years in North Carolina before that I I, I know this <clears throat> I know this fleet you know it's a highly mobile highly efficient fleet as Mr. Murphy pointed out and it's one that as Mr. Gilmore pointed out the vast majority of the take is coming from one area with individuals working right next to each other and now this this group here is being asked 
to take permits away from some individuals or, or at least a chunk of their livelihood and hand it to other individuals fishing in the same area. And they're saying that, it, you know, that we have to do this because the, the species has, has either moved or the, the stock has increased. And I, I think that's a tough decision for the folks here. Um, and I think, you know, in that joint management framework that Mr. Uh, Pentney discussed, I think uh, keeping into consideration the five years that we've put into this already. Thank you, Joe. Eric Reed. So at this point, you're getting your for and against um, very nicely. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I do support the motion. Um, <laughs> I've been with this one a long time, too. And I, I, I just, we, 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 we need something else. I mean, around this table, we're all very hardworking and well-meaning individuals. but. There are issues when it comes to what Mr. Gilmore referred to as states' rights. Um, so, in my opinion, uh, we, we need some sort of recipe or some formula or some unbiased methodology that can deal with the effects of uh, the movement of the biomass, particularly when it comes to climate change. We also need some some process or some guidance or some informed advice that allows us to mitigate the effects of politics. And, and my, my opinion is if we have some sort of modeling that has been proposed by people to my left and my right, um, that we can mitigate politics. Um, and you know, that, the, actually, uh, the ASMFC has a document that was published on, it's a man, management guidance document, it's from February 2018, and it's an eight page discussion of how to deal with issues like this given uh, climate change and other management strategies. And I would suggest no matter how this goes that everybody read it or reread it, whatever the case may be. Um, so here we are. <laughs> and of course, uh, Mr. Penny was very kind to point out that um, we're looking at chaos. His version of chaos is, is a, a little bit closer to us than Mr. Gilmore's version of chaos, which is a little bit further away from us. But it would be my opinion that it's in the best interest of all of us to deal with chaos now and the problems that we have and the methodology we could develop to solve those problems by passing this motion. So thank you. Thank you, Eric. Jason? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so we will now be getting out of sync with, it's okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, I'll try not to be too long winded, um, kind of working off of what Eric just said, I thought I'd offer a little bit of context. So while allocations haven't been changing, just a couple of years ago, we had gone through a series of years where we had about a 60% decrease in the coastwide quota for this species. And so I've heard the word robust used a couple of times, and this seems like a, a fishery that is able to be robust to these types of, of changes. And I think we have a real opportunity here to do something objective, as Eric mentioned, to, to step back a little bit. I think a, a lot of folks around the table would agree that the past couple of days and a couple of weeks have been really challenging, um, you know, kind of sows ill will to some extent. And this is an opportunity to develop a system where it's more formulaic. We agree to that formula ahead of time, and the system moves. We're working with dynamic resources, and we've got some alternatives that can accommodate those dynamic resources in a formulaic way. Uh, just a, a parting thought. We're thinking, it's easy to think in, in lines, and I think we have a tendency to do that as human beings, but it's important to 
remember that nature is full of curves and, and um, I think this resource is no different and, and so we're thinking of climate change and it's unidirectional but there are other forcing processes in particular with the species and just as an example the AMO is one and so we might be shifting into a new AMO regime where this might shift back to the way it was a couple decades ago and we could have a system in place that would accommodate that move quota back to the south tracking the stock where it goes so keep that in mind as well that this isn't unidirectional and the one of the alternatives that we're talking about has the capacity to move back and forth with it to do so in a measured way and uh, I just hope folks will think about this in, in that context and try to get us out of this this box thank you thank you Jay so here's where where I'd like to go um, <clears throat> I've got a long list still I think we got Pat Kelleher and Robert Boyles they may be undecided since they're not part of the summer flounder board so I'm not gonna ask them if they're for or against and then I'd like to go to the audience see if there's any quick comments from the audience then I'll come back with uh, for and against at the board and then we'll uh, once we sort of cover that we'll, um, we'll we'll vote on the substitute motion so with that I'll go with uh, Pat Kelleher thank you mr. chairman um, I, I, I normally would say I don't have a dog in this fight um, as referenced earlier by my good friend from the south who seems to be sitting to my north right now but um, we there, there is a precedent being set here associated with these issues and as I think about um, summer flounder and specifically about black sea bass this distribution shift um, becomes much more important to states to the north and because of that uh, I will be supporting um, this motion uh, going forward thank you thanks Pat Robert <clears throat> thank you mr. chairman um, I certainly don't purport to speak for my colleagues here on the southern rampart, but um, you know we find ourselves. I find myself in an odd situation, um, and and I, I'm concerned with the substitute motion um, for the following reason: um, we have a joint plan, whether we like it or whether we don't like it. There is a joint plan. Um, we're in this boat together. Um, that was a decision that has been made uh, prior to my arrival here uh, around the table. And um, as best I can tell on my very, very um, embarrassingly limited knowledge, uh, we have a valid vote um, by both the management board, a close vote, but a valid vote nonetheless. And. Um, and according to the regional administrator um, the mid-atlantic council as i understand it the mid-atlantic plan will be submitted to the secretary of commerce for implementation um, which as mr pentany has pointed out could lead to um, wildly divergent potentially wildly divergent management schemes for a resource for which we are collectively responsible so um, I think where I'm ending up is I can't support the substitute. Um, there's an African proverb, if you'll um, allow me. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I think you all know that uh, we're very interested in the long ball game. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Any, are there any comments from the audience? Uh, is that Mike Luisi? Is that your hand up? Mike, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And you thought you were on a hot seat this afternoon. You should have been there in March um, during that meeting. <coughs> Excuse me. So my name is Mike Luizzi, and I'm here before you not as the striped bass man or a number of other names that I'm often called, but as, a, as the chair of the Mid-Atlantic Council. And I, I can't do any justice to what Robert Boyles just said. Um, his comments were... We're spot on about us moving forward as a joint body. And something that I have given a lot of thought to, it has to do with 
with the partnership that we're, that we're in. And I'm speaking on behalf of the, of the council um, to the commission based on that partnership between the board and our council. And for four years, um, well, let's, I'll say this, for 25 years, we've had a partnership. And partnerships aren't always easy. Uh, there are times when you don't agree. Uh, things can often move very slowly. Um, arguments happen. But you come to a, an agreement at some point within a partnership about how you get things done, and often it's through compromise. Um, we've worked very long and hard, both as a council and uh, with the uh, Summer Flounder Board, uh, to get to the point where we are today. Um, and, you know, Mr. Pentney uh, spoke very eloquently and kind of confused me a bit with how some of his quota an, uh, analyses, but he was spot on in that if we have diverging or divergent quotas in the future between state and federal um, waters, it creates problems. Uh, I also see that a situation where the commission decides to move away from the 25-year partnership with the council, we're going to have relationships which are going to start to deteriorate. And it's a concern for me and it's a concern for our council in that we need to continue operating together as we move forward. We have, um, we have a number of, of actions that we're currently working on together. Um, comes. The, uh, we've got the black, we've got black sea bass commercial allocations that uh, we just talked about earlier today. We have the recreational black sea bass reform initiatives that we're, that we're working on. Um, I foresee, as I hope many of you do, that with the MRIP recalibrations and the operational assessments that are going to take place this summer on, um, on black sea bass, scup, and bluefish, that we're going to be having to sit down together to figure out how we're going to move forward with um, the commercial and recreational splits that we have. I mean, these are big issues, and a lot of them have to do with allocation. Uh, and, you know, I see this motion as a, as a moving away from that relationship, and I just wanted to make sure, I, I just wanted to put that out there. Um, it does concern me, and um, I can take any questions if there are any for the, you know, to speak as a council, but that's all I had uh, today, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate the comments. Anyone else from the audience? All right. Seeing no hands in the audience, I'd like to go back to the table. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of comments on this, a lot of well thought out comments, very impressive, you know, perspectives from on both sides of this. So, um, Doug, you have not talked. Um, I'll let Doug, he's going to go first and whatever. He says we're going to go the opposite on the next speaker, and then we're going to rotate. But you know, at some point, there's going to be a point where more discussion probably won't change anyone's vote. So um, you know, we, we may already be there, but I think we, we the folks that haven't spoken, I think it, it's fair to them to, to give them a chance to talk. So with that, Doug Grout. So thank you, Mr. Chair. As you know, um, I. I uh, uh, in the past, we've always, uh, as a full commission here, generally we have, when a board has gone through and had um, uh, put a lot of hard work into an amendment, um, the full commission has generally fully supported that hard work that was put in. And uh, as an aside, I, I want to disagree with my colleague to the right. I think New Hampshire does have a dog in the fight here. And I greatly appreciate the uh, Summer Founder Board giving us an option here where we'll be able to, uh, with the approval of this amendment, that we'd be able to go from five and a half to six pounds of fluke in our quota. I, I, I really appreciate that. I did say we have a dog in the Okay. <laughs> uh, but that being said, um, you all know me when I was uh, chair of this commission. I. I uh, work very hard to try and develop uh, uh, a climate change working group and trying to come up with a, uh, a policy on how this commission would deal with the impacts of, of changing ocean conditions. And uh, I firmly believe that 
this commission, as well as our partners at the council, at the two councils, and National Marine Fishery Service, really need to take a hard look at how we manage these uh, a variety of fisheries because things are changing <clears throat> and will change. And they, as they say, they may um, uh, change in the uh, back in the future. Um, I. <clears throat> um, certainly uh, appreciate uh, the hard work to try and take a first step on this by the board. Uh, I think that in the future, uh, the, um, our boards need to look at some kind of a concept like uh, Jay McNamee put forward as something that would, uh, some kind of a reallocation uh, uh, scenario which would be formulaic and would change as the stocks change. Um, I think we need to look at that seriously. Um, so at this point, uh, I'm still going to uh, suggest that we abstain from this at, at this point. Um, I'll have to talk to my colleague here if we're here <laughs> because we know we're up the hill. But uh, I, if we don't, uh, uh, I think we need to move forward uh, in the future with other species um, uh, in changing the way we uh, manage things here and deal with these state-by-state -state, uh, uh, allocations. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. I didn't put an abstention into my pro and con little scenario here. So with that, I'll go to David Pierce because he had his hand up and he has not spoken yet. And then we'll sort out where to go from there. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Bob. Uh, I do support the motion to substitute for a number of reasons, many of which have already been stated. Uh, this trigger-based option doesn't adequately address the problem. Uh, it's illogical the way it has been, excuse me, <clears throat> it's illogical the way it has been laid out, the way it has been adopted by the council. For example, the trigger-based option reallocates quota to states indifferent of their geographic location and its relation to the species distributional shift, which has occurred by delivering equal shares of 12.4 percent to most states, the trigger-based option takes from states with allocations above this percent and gives to states with allocations below it, regardless of their location along the coast. And whether their access to summer flounder is decreasing or increasing, there's already been a mention already, Rhode Island has been mentioned. So to me, it's illogical. Uh, in addition, I, I fervently believe that it, the motion, the, the council's decision, uh, turns a blind eye to the commission's strategic plan regarding dealing with species shifts. Uh, and then finally, I'll, I'll just simply say that, you know, Mike Luisi did say, and, and I understand why, that ASMSC should not move away from the council. Uh, I look at it the other way. The council is moving away from ASMFC. Uh, so that's, those are my uh, principal reasons why I think it does make sense to remand it back, to take a look at some of the other options that I think are uh, sensible, that, that uh, have already been not, uh, mentioned by a few people, and that, that, that definitely did not get fair and inadequate airing you know, by, the, by the full council itself. Thank you, David. Any speakers in opposition that, that haven't spoken yet? Tom, I think you've spoken once. Okay. Um, I'll go with Tom, and then we'll come back. I talked about summer flounder in the uh, context of something else, how we deal with the quotas, the giant increase in quota. Um, I've been around this, on, on this issue when it became a joint plan. That's how long I've been sitting here. And we did it for certain reasons. I always didn't like it. I mean, going back, I think it's when Bill Hogar was the head of NIMS, I actually got the commission to vote the opposite of what NIMS put in place. Of course, Bill Hogar, and, and we, we supported that, until Bill Hogar showed up to the next meeting and says, well, you can do whatever you want, but I'll shut the EEZ when I decide that you might go over quota and shut it to everybody. So then we withdrew that motion and realized we have to work together. Um, I've been... New Jersey has been in a unique position for the last five years, or actually the last seven years, because we've been kicked around back and forth on recreational summer flounder quota by some of the states, 
and they keep trying to put us in a different district to benefit them because we do have a large part of it. And even on the new maps, it doesn't so show New Jersey's out of – matter of fact, they're actually migrating to our state, but we're never asking for a larger quota. Matter of fact, when it came to black sea bass, we are the only state that I've ever seen around this table that actually donated – Bruce Freeman, because he was very nice and understanding to everybody, donated 20 percent of our black sea bear quota to the north just to make sure that we can get a plan in place. I haven't seen any, any other state do that. So we've looked at it this. I also remember when we sat around, oh, I guess about 15 years ago, and tried to figure out how we would deal with the fact that New York, because they're trying to avoid taxes and everything, basically had very bad underreporting of it, because they wanted to the, uh, the group that controlled the fisheries in New York was not the, the our most honest group in all, and they basically that's why they went to the system they went to. It wasn't our fault, it was New York's fault. And we tried to correct that, and we had looked at, as we were going up in quota, that we would sp split up the new quota above a certain point, just what we're doing here, and basically divide it equally. Of course, then we winded up in this crazy situation where we were fishing back then at 29 million pounds when the stocks were rebuilding, and now we went down to 16 million pounds. So that never, because we never reached the point where we were going to distribute that quota. Um, after have looking at all those facts, was I happy with this one? No, I think it could have been, but we worked hard on it. We put four years of time in it, and I've listened to go back and forth, and we're going to do fine no matter where we fall out on this subject, because we still are in the major path because we finally decided we should be region by ourselves since they didn't want the south because we're too big and didn't want us in the north because we're too big. I have to s oppose this motion. I mean, we've got a system in place. I've been trying to dispose the system for about the last 15 years and realize I can't, so we have to work together with the Mid-Atlantic Council. And my, I wish the New England Council, which a lot of northern states, worked better with us on winter flounder and a few other species, but they don't seem to be coming to the table that way and hammer them offshore. So I have, a rather, I have my own feelings about how they, we get fair and equitably treated at this thing. I put up with it. We get, we get kicked back and forth. But I think I'll support with, uh, support with the Mid-Atlantic Council and the Commission. Also, we're going to miss one of the voting members because at that, because Potomac River is involved in the fishery, had a vote. And that was part of the vote. And they don't sit at the business meeting with a vote. They do sit at the policy committee. So I uh, should be looking at that. Anyway. I'll, I'll leave it there because we're going over time. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, we're getting pretty tight on time. Tom spoke in opposition. Um, I think we're quickly getting to the point where, you know, everyone's sort of said their piece and, and may be ready to vote. Uh, are there any, is there anyone next would be in favor of the substitute that hasn't spoken yet? Anyone else that has a compelling need to say anything else before uh, there's a vote on the substitute motion? Seeing no hands. All those in, let me, I don't need to read it. It has not been amended since it was put in. Yeah, yeah. two-minute caucus. Anyone need more time on the caucus? All right, seeing none, um, this is a vote um, on the substitute motion that's up on the board to remand this back to the Summer Flounder Scout Black Sea Bass Management Board for further action. All those in favor of the, mo the substitute motion, please raise your hand. All right, hands down. Those in opposition, like sign. I think that's it. Any abstentions or any null votes? One abstention. No. You're all alone, Doug. <laughs> I can't agree with myself a lot either, Doug. Don't worry about it. So um, the motion fails for lack of majority. Five in favor, nine in opposition, and one null vote. That brings us back to the main motion. Well, that's coming back up. Any, any, again, anyone have a compelling need to make a comment on the main motion? I think we were kind of mixing comments on the substitute and the main motion throughout that conversation. So, any other, any, any hands? Yes, Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, as part of that um, summer flounder um, commercial allocation um, amendment, one of the things that was done was there was a revision to the summer flounder goals and objectives. We changed the goals and objectives in that amendment process. So I'll refer to the new objective 3.1. Provide reasonable access to the fishery throughout the management unit. Fishery allocations and other management measures should 
balance responsiveness to changing social, economic, and ecological conditions with historic and current importance to various user groups and communities. And uh, I don't think that this amendment meets its own objective 3.1. Thank you, Emerson. Seeing no other hands, this is a final action, so I'll have to do a roll call vote. Let me read the motion into the record. It was modified um, throughout our conversation. <clears throat> Move on behalf of the Summer Flounder Scup and Black Sea Bass Management Board to consider approval of the Summer Flounder Commercial Issues Amendment. The effective date of any FMP modifications would be consistent with the effective date published in the final rule in the Federal Register. So with that, I'll uh, call the roll. <clears throat> Starting in the north, Maine. No. New Hampshire. Abstain. Um, Massachusetts. No. Rhode Island. No. Connecticut. No. New York. No. New Jersey. Yes. Pennsylvania. Yes. Delaware. Yes. Maryland. Yes. Virginia. Yes. North Carolina. Yes. South Carolina. Yes. Georgia. Yes. And Florida. Yes. <clears throat> the motion carries. Nine votes in favor, five in opposition, and one abstention. All right, anything else to come before the business session? Um, the next agenda item is any noncompliance findings if needed. There are, luckily, no noncompliance findings at this time. Um, with that, there is opportunity for another business session tomorrow, should we need one. I don't think we will. But with that, uh, the business session will be adjourned.